Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a good afternoon. Uh, so like Andrew said, my name is Katie Parker, and I work as a local foods and small farms educator. And today I'm going to be talking about pecans. Next slide, please. So pecans are um, really some great trees. I'm sure you're all familiar with pecan trees, but um, they provide us a lot of di a diverse um, diverse benefits in our landscape. So not only can we use them as landscape trees uh, in that they are long lived, provide a nice fall color and we can relax and they provide us with shade, but they also can provide uh, food and cover for wildlife. If you do plan to grow pecan trees for uh, the nut, they can be a low input tree. So that's also a benefit as well. And then longer term speaking, if um, it is uh, you have issues with it, it can be valuable timber. And then also the nuts are important as well. Next slide, please. So pecan trees are native from Iowa to Indiana and anywhere south to Texas and Mexico. Uh, so they can survive in a large range of area. They are found naturally growing along rivers, floodplains, deltas. Um, so more of these uh, water-filled soil areas or areas that can flood. Um, and so they do well in those areas. They're not very fussy on soil pH, so they'll, they'll survive uh, in alkaline soils as well as acidic soils, um, but they too tend to do a bit better in acidic soils. They do need well-draining soils, so um, although they do grow along rivers or in those floodplains, and we wanna make sure that the soils do drain well to prevent crown and root problems. They do have an extensive root system, especially with the Northern Pecan, that develops to help make it more drought tolerant. And it also limits the uh, recommendations for a starter size tree. So that can make it a bit more difficult uh, when planting it. People seeking the best results for nut production from their northern pecans should start with smaller trees. So anything about a four inch pot is ideal. When starting a small size, uh, we wanna make sure that these smaller trees are planted deep enough for the tap root. And because the northern pecan has such a wide native range, purchasing a tree from a nursery that collects seeds from the northern part of its range will be important to assure winter hardiness in those cooler areas. Next slide, please. So some identifying factors for pecans are they are the largest tree in the hickory family. So they can grow to become a fairly large tree. They can grow to be anywhere from 75 to 100 feet tall and 40 to 70 feet wide. Um, so that's something to consider when planting because we wanna make sure that the fully developed tree is going to have a large enough area to be able to develop into. They're also identified by their compound pinnate leaves. So you can see a, um, a leaf here on the left hand side of what it would look like. So they can typically have anywhere from nine to 17 leaflets. And then they're pretty, pretty large. So anywhere from 12 to 20 inches long. And then you could also see the bark of a pecan tree. So if that's a way that works for you to identify one, uh, that's also a great way of doing that as well. Next slide, please. When planting pecan trees, there's a couple of different things that we want to consider when selecting a variety. So with the length of the growing season, uh, pecan trees need a frost free growing season of 100 day, 180 days or more. So we want to make sure that uh, we're providing the plant for the tree with enough time to be able to produce nuts during that growing season. For southern varieties, they need 220 or more days to ripen. Um, so it's probably not best to plant a southern variety up north where we're located as it may not have the time to ripen and it may not have that cold hardiness. So northern varieties have been selected for earlier ripening. Uh, so that's something to consider. As I had mentioned, cold tolerance. So our southern varieties aren't going to be quite as cold hardy as 
uh, our northern varieties. So for Illinois range, we're going to look more for a northern variety of pecans when planting. As for pollination requirements, po pecans are self-pollinated. However, they will yield a larger crop if pollinated with another variety of pecan. When bu buying a pecan tree, it will often have suggestions of another variety to provide adequate pollination. And then lastly, you'll want to pay attention to scab resistance as pecan scab can be an issue. When purchasing a pecan tree, most nurseries or seed catalogs will provide information to help you make decisions on what to buy. A nice resource that I did find was put out by Dr. William Reed. He worked as a pecan research specialist for Kansas and Missouri, and now he is retired and owns his own 30-acre pecan orchard, so you can tell it's definitely a passion of his. But in his blog, which the link is right here, he provides some nice information on um, some of his research that he did. So he provides pictures of the nuts, information on nut size, maturity, and scab resistance. So I really enjoyed looking through the list. Uh, there's many different cultivars that are native to areas near us. So there was one named Canton, which was found in Canton, Missouri, which is actually just across the river from where I'm located. There's also a couple others, Woody being one that is located in Burlington, Iowa, which is close to Chris. There was a sure crop that was one found in Nebo, Illinois. Um, and he provides some interesting information about them as well. So that one was one that Stark Brothers, which is a pretty well-known nursery named and patented it. So um, they own the rights to that now. But there's all kinds of interesting information. And if you're looking for different pecan varieties or cultivars, that you are interested in, it provides some information there as well. But when we do come to, uh, when it does come to planting pecan trees, we want to make sure that we accommodate for the size of them. So as I had mentioned in the last slide, they can get fairly large. And so that's something that we need to factor in when we're planting the trees. Next slide, please. I'm not going to get too far in depth on planting because I'm sure uh, with the other presentations from Chris, Ken, and Andrew, they'll um, cover some of that and it's pretty repetitive. Um, so they'll cover that, but some things with pecans is we wanna make sure that we're properly fertilizing these trees. So it's one of the most important practices for nut bearing trees. If the trees are to produce a good crop, we wanna make sure that terminal growth should be around six inches each year. So one thing that we can do to assess if our plants or our trees need um, additional nutrients is we can do a leaf analysis or a soil test. If you don't have access to either one of those, the recommendations for fertilizing pecan trees is to broadcast four pounds of a complete fertilizer, such as 10, 10, 10, um, for every inch of trunk diameter. So as the plant grows, you'll obviously be applying more nutrients. And then for nitrogen, they do suggest applying a rate of one pound per inch of trunk diameter in no more than eight pounds per tree. Um, and these applications can be done in mid to late March. So zinc is a, a nutrient that can be important in trees, especially in pecan production. So zinc needs to be determined by a leaf analysis. So what you can do is you can um, pull leaves from the tree and send them off to a lab to get analyzed for nutrient uptake. And this can be done in July or early August. And this will tell us how much zinc we need to apply. In the absence of a leaf analysis, again, uh, the recommendation is one pound of zinc sulfate to young trees per year. And as the trees get older, we're applying three to five pounds to older trees. You can also, from a soil sample, assess the soil pH. So if it's too high or too low, we can adjust that to make sure it's in that range that pecan trees prefer. Uh, typically, they would suggest a range anywhere from 6 to 6.5. Next slide, please. So as for watering, water has more of an effect on pecan production than any other environmental factor particularly where nut quality is concerned. 
So drought stress can affect nut size and filling as well as leaf and shoot growth. Adequate soil moisture is important at bud break for stimulating strong, vigorous growth. And then that can also be important from bloom through shell for hardening of nut size and then also for nut filling. So here's a picture that I found was interesting. So you can see that the nut on the left has not filled completely. And likely that's due to some kind of stress that can be a deficiency of water, maybe nutrients, it could be excessive heat. Uh, so it could be from multiple factors, but we wanna eliminate those stresses as uh, much as possible. The nut sizing period occurs from May 1st through August 15th. So this is um, not necessarily a critical water use stage for pecan, but serious drought conditions during this period can affect yield. The most visible effects of an extended drought during this period are excessive nut drought and shell hardening on small nuts. So a lack of sufficient water during the nut sizing period also causes small nuts and may lead to water stage fruit split, which results from a sudden influx of water during the nut filling stage in some varieties. For nut filling that occurs during August 15th to the first week in October, and that can often depend on the variety and where you're located. So this is the most critical period for water use during the first two weeks of September and a lack of sufficient water during this stage will likely lead to poorly filled nuts, poor nut quality, and increased alternate bearing. Next slide, please. As for flowering, this occurs in April and May. Um, as I had mentioned previously, so pecans are self-pollinating, but they do produce better um, when they have a different variety to pollinate with. And so being self-pollinating, they do have male and female flowers on the same tree, but they are separate, which means that they are monoecious. And then as I had mentioned too, they're self-pollinating, but we can get larger nuts by being uh, pollinated by a different tree. Next slide, please. So as for nut production, our nuts do ripen in September or October. So that's something to look forward to. They can develop as singles or they can be clusters of three to 11 nuts. So in the background, you can see that there's a variety of different size clusters. Um, so that, that's not something to be worried about if you don't have large clusters. As they develop, they are enclosed in a thin green husk, which you can see in the background picture. But then as the husk mature, they do turn brown. And then um, once they are, the nuts are ready to be harvested, um, those husks do split. And then you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we have the nut that is developing in that husk. And so it has a brown shell. And then what we eat is to the left of that picture. And so that's what we're most familiar with with pecans. So pecan trees can be grafted. Um, they have been developed over years and it is more common for grafting to occur. So with grafting, it typically can take anywhere from six to seven years for nut production. Whereas with non-grafted grafted or native trees, it does take a bit longer for those nuts to produce and can be anywhere from 10 to 15 years. Next slide, please. So nut harvest and storage is actually pretty cool and it can vary based off of a single or a couple of trees in your backyard to a nut orchard or a pecan orchard. As a fully produced or productive tree, it can produce anywhere from 70 to 150 pounds of nuts each year. When we harvest them, you can see in the picture on the upper right, that is when, um, the nuts are fully developed and they'll likely start to drop from the tree at that point. When we harvest the nuts, we wanna make sure that we do dry the nuts anywhere from eight to 10% moisture. For a longer term storage, that can be anywhere from three and a half to four and a half percent. 
for a small scale uh, production, I would do something as simple as putting the nuts in a burlap bag with in a location with good ventilation and heat. Whereas commercially, they would use air dryers uh, that for, or that heat the air up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and do that. So some different ways of uh, harvesting. You can see in these pictures, there's a simple um, little roller cage that you can roll along the ground and they can help in harvesting on the smaller scale. And so that's something that a homeowner you can use to, to help ease nut uh, collecting. So that way they don't have to be on like their hands or knees or bend over a lot to pick those up. Large scale, you can see in the picture with the tractor and the green thing around the tree. So what they do is they um, put that onto the tree and it, it shakes the tree a bit to release the nuts from the tree. And then in the last picture, um, you can see that it's kind of like an upside down umbrella. And so you can have that underneath the tree when you shake it and it can help to collect the nuts that way. Uh, so just some different ways that we can uh, collect nuts on the small scale and commercial scale. Next slide, please. So obviously, uh, once you get all the hard work out of the way, there's all kinds of delicious way to use pecans. So um, as we just finished up Thanksgiving, hopefully, or maybe some of you guys enjoyed pecans as part of your dessert or as part of your meal, but oftentimes we'll enjoy pecans and pecan pie. Um, coming up with Christmas, also commonly used for pecan pralines, a lot of different sweets, including cookies, breads. They can also be used for salad toppings. Um, Chris would probably love it in ice cream. He seems to always mention walnut ice cream that he enjoyed when he was in school. So that's a great way to uh, enjoy pecans as well. They can be used in pecan milk, pecan oil. And then like I had mentioned, um, the wood can be of high quality as well and can be used in woodworking for uh, higher quality woodworking projects. And then there's also been a mention too that the shells can be used as mulch. Uh, so that's an option, or if you had enough production and had some plenty of shells, you could do that route as well. Next slide, please. So one of the most common diseases of pecans is pecan scab. So that's one that um, I had mentioned that we would look at when choosing a tree for production is we want high resistance to pecan scab as it is one that um, can cause a lot of issues with your pecan tree. So it can cause losses anywhere from 50 to 100%. Uh, and that's definitely something that you would not want to experience. Some things to look for with pecan scab is small circular olive green spots that will turn to black. And it can be found on the leaves, petioles, or nut shucks. Infection from this can cause premature nut drop or the shuck can adhere to the nut surface. So then you can't break it away. And then that's pretty well not useful. If an infection occurs later in the season, it can cause a decrease in nut size. And the best way to control it is by planting resistant varieties. We can widen our tree spacing. So we can, it's more of a, like a, a cultural practice where we're preventing the spread by um, providing an environment where the disease won't do well. And then um, something that's very commonly used is fungicides to help to prevent it. And so oftentimes that's something that you're doing sometimes up to three times a year uh, as it can be pretty severe. One beneficial thing about pecan scab fungicides is if you have to spray for pecan scab, then uh, that fungicide is likely uh, preventing many other fun or many other diseases that pecans can experience. One of those being brown spot. It's not quite as severe as pecan scab, but it can cause issues as well. And it is one that we can frequently see. Next slide, please. Some other diseases include anthracnose, powdery mildew, crown gall, downy spot, shuck dieback, and stem end blight. 
And so things like anthracnose and powdery mildew, those are ones we see pretty frequently. Um, but with some of these diseases, they are just foliar diseases. So if we remove any disease leaves, um, like rake them up from the base of the tree, or even just mulching the leaves that can help to prevent it from occurring year after year. And then lastly, we have insects of pecans. There's many different insects that can um, damage pecan trees, but our best method, best, sorry, best methods of preventing these is just like I said, sanitation. So cleaning up dropped leaves or nuts that insects or diseases can overwinter on. We also wanna make sure that we're monitoring and scouting. So with insects, we can use pheromone traps. Also just checking leaves. Uh, that sounds easier said than done as trees can um, be far from the ground and difficult to do so. And then biological control. So if that's an option, it's a, a nice one to use as well. And then we also have insecticides, but we always wanna be um, careful with those as we can damage or uh, cause harm to, to other insects that can be beneficial to us. So next up, I believe we have All right, so next up, we have got chestnuts. So you may or may not have ever eaten chestnuts before, but um, there are they are referenced in some Christmas songs and stuff. So it is a, at one time at least, a popular nut here in the United States, and it is um, rather popular around the world um, as well. So chestnuts are in the same family as beeches and oaks, the Phagaceae. Uh, chestnuts belong to the genus Castania, so all of the chestnuts um, they grow around the world belong to the single genus. The, the chestnuts themselves, those nuts are within the spiny burr, and you can see that picture here. Uh, if you've never seen one of these or handled one, those spines are very sharp and they are rather painful to pick up with your bare hands. So if you, this is something you're going to grow, um, that's something you want to keep in mind. Um, maybe not the best shade tree out there uh, since they're dropping these rather spiny burrs. Uh, kind of think of them like sweet gum balls on steroids. Uh, and then the nuts themselves are, are kind of unique, different than most of the nuts we think about. Uh, they're rather fleshy and they have a starchy texture. They're about 49% carbohydrate, 44% water. Um, so because of this, they uh, will spoil rather easily. We can't leave these you know, on the, on the counter in a bowl with other nuts. These need to be refrigerated um, or the, the quality will decline rather quickly. Uh, so there are some other plants we refer to as chestnut horse chestnuts or buckeyes are sometimes called horse chestnuts uh, that can be confused with one another. Uh, the horse chestnut or buckeye are toxic, so this is not something you want to eat. Uh, so you can see in comparison here, uh, again, our chestnuts have that spiny uh, burr that is enclosing the nuts, whereas our buckeyes or horse chestnuts have a more fleshy um, covering on them, and they're, they're, the husks are more bumpy than they are spiny. And then the nuts themselves on chestnuts, they have these little tufts uh, on the end of the nuts. That's the style and other flower parts that are still attached to that nut. Uh, whereas the, the buckeyes of the horse chestnuts are round um, and smooth all the way around. Um, and then chestnuts um, are going to have a flat side to them. Typically, at least one side is going to be flat if they, if they develop properly uh, within that burr. So when it comes to growing chestnuts, there's four uh, primary species that are going to be grown or hybrids of them. So all of these uh, species will cross with each other and form hybrids. Uh, so Chinese chestnuts are probably the most widely grown, mainly because they have very high blight uh, chestnut blight resistance. So you can see um, the size of these trees. American chestnut um, can get rather large. Um, they have rather small nuts, which is just a drawback, but they, from people who have eaten them, they're kind of considered the best flavored nuts, even though they are smaller. Problem is they have absolutely no resistance to chestnut blight, so they are not really um, grown, at least extensively east of the Mississippi. Now we also have European and Japanese uh, chestnuts as well, and a lot of those will be some hybridized with these other species for a more commercial varieties that are grown. Um, so if, we'll talk about briefly about the American chestnut here. Uh, so the American chestnuts are capable of reaching 100 plus feet tall, uh, trunk diameters over 10 feet. Uh, so these are kind of the redwoods uh, of the eastern United States. These are massive um, kind of keystone species, or they were at one point. 
At one time, you can see in that map there, they stretched from Maine to Mississippi, uh, covered an estimated 200 million acres um, of the United States, primarily along the Appalachian Mountains. And at some point, some areas in the Appalachian Mountains, one in three trees was a chestnut. I think about over, overall, about 20% of the trees in the Appalachian Mountains used to be chestnuts uh, at one point. They are a very important uh, species. They produce a large, consistent seed crop. When we think about some of our other nut trees, especially like oaks and stuff, we have uh, mast years where they may be real heavy one year, and then the next year or two, seed production isn't as high. With chestnuts, you get a the American chestnut, you've got a consistent seed crop every year, which is very important, not only for wildlife, uh, but also for the people that lived um, in this area. You can look in, in kind of the literature and see references to in some areas where there are really a lot of chestnut trees. Um, chestnuts will be four inches deep on the forest floor because these, these plants would put out uh, so many chestnuts. Um, they're also a vital lumber source. They are straight grained, uh, very strong wood, and that is also rot resistant. So a very valuable tree, not only for food, but also um, for lumber. They also grow a lot faster than oaks. So you can get that, that wood a lot quicker in comparison to oaks anyway. Uh, and many, if not most of the, the log cabins that were built east of the Mississippi um, used to be made um, from chestnut, American chestnut, at least when it was still around. Um, and I came across a quote from George Coleman, uh, who said that the American chestnut carried a man from cradle to grave in crib and coffin. So not only were homes built with the wood from these uh, furniture, fence posts, because they were rot resistant, barns, all kinds of different things. So, so an incredibly important uh, tree species. Unfortunately, uh, they have absolutely no resistance to chestnut blight. Chestnut blight is a pathogen uh, that is native to Asia. It was first noticed um, in New York City, in the New, New York Zoological Park, which is now the Bronx Zoo. Um, it was in 1904. That was when it was first noticed. It's kind of speculated maybe earlier than that came in, probably late 1800s, early, a few years early, like 1900 or so. So when it first got into the US, uh, more than likely on imported chestnut trees from either China or Japan. By 1906, so two years later, 98% of the trees in the Bronx uh, were infected by 1912. All of the trees in New York, all chestnut trees in New York City, at least American chestnut trees, were dead and it spread to 10 states. Um, and it was spread at a rate of about 50 miles a year, primarily human aided. So as these trees died, people would go out and log them. Now they would get the spores from this pathogen on their tools, on their clothes, on their boots. And then when they would go to other areas, they would transport it. By 1930, it had reached Georgia. So gone from New York to Georgia, um, in about what, 26 years, 25 years or so. Um, by 1940, almost every chestnut tree in the Appalachian region was either dead or showing symptoms. So basically within about 50 years, um, American chestnuts were almost completely wiped out in the Eastern United States. It's estimated about three to 4 billion trees um, were destroyed. So again, this is a lot of trees um, and it had some really, it has some really big effects on the ecosystem. Again, all of those nuts that typically fed animals are now gone. Um, so there's a lot of reduced food out there uh, for the people that lived in the area. Again, a vital food source for not only them, for their livestock, uh, also disappeared building material, all of that stuff. So kind of a cautionary tale, of, again, of invasive species and stuff. Um, so enough of the doom and gloom. Uh, so when it comes to growing chestnuts, um, obviously they need to be blight resistant. If you don't have blight resistant trees, more than likely they will succumb to it at some point, um, or you just need to assume that. Uh, when you're planting chestnuts, you wanna plant at least three, tre three trees. They are not self-pollinating, they're incompatible. Uh, so you need multiple trees so you get good pollination. If you have one tree, you're probably not gonna get any nuts off that. If you're growing uh, named cultivars that are grafted, again, you're gonna to have to have multiple cultivars uh, so they can pollinate one another. You can do um, either seeds uh, or seedlings. So seeds, you know, if you buy chestnuts from people, you can plant those seeds. Um, you can either plant them directly in the ground um, in the fall, or you can put them in a, um, a plastic bag with some moist potting mix, poke some holes in there, put that in your refrigerator. A lot of times the crisper drawer, about 34 to 38 degrees. Um, check those occasionally because you may get some mold in there if you have any moldy nuts, remove those. And then after about 60 to 90 days, those seeds are probably gonna start germinating. 
Um, we'll start root development. When you see that, you want to remove those seeds, uh, pot them up, and give them sunlight, uh, full sun, all that stuff. And then after the danger of frost has passed, you can then go uh, plant those outdoors in their permanent area. You can also buy seedling or grafted trees um, as well. Again, those named cultivars. Um, and you would just go out and plant those like you would um, a typical tree. Spacing, at least in a, in the, in a home setting, you typically want to do this about 40 to 50 feet apart. You don't want to get them too close because when they start shading each other, um, you have reduced nut production. Um, so 40 to 50 feet apart is a good, is a good distance. You can go up to 200 feet. Um, if you get much further than that, then pollination can become an issue. They do need well-drained soils. Slightly acidic would be best pH, uh, 5.5 to 6.5, maybe a slight slope. Uh, like, you can see, like you can see in this picture here, this is at University of Missouri, um, one of their research stations. Um, they have a big chestnut planting there. Um, but those well-drained soils are really important because that's going to help with um, some of the, some soil uh, disease issues we can have. And like I mentioned before, these do not necessarily make good shade trees because they are dropping these big um, spiny burrs that you really don't want to be walking on. Um, and you have to clean those up. So if, if you don't like sweet gums, chestnuts may not be the tree for you, at least from the dropping stuff perspective. Uh, these are just a few of the chestnut cultivars that are recommended by University of Missouri. Again, they've got um, some plantings where they've done some research uh, on chestnuts. So those first four are recommended um, by them, nuts per pound. Um, the smaller the number, the bigger the nuts are. So that's, people tend to want larger nuts than they do smaller nuts. Um, that Dunstan variety, um, that wasn't one recommended, but I do know there is at least one um, orchard in, in Illinois, and there's probably more that grow Dunstan um, and have done so successfully for a number of years. Um, so that would be another one. If you're looking at chestnuts that you may want to look into, um, as well. When it comes to pollination, again, these are not self-fertile, so you do have to have uh, multiple trees and multiple cultivars. If you're planting seeds, um, you don't have to worry about um, that. They're not genetically the same like cultivars would be, named, some of the named cultivars. Uh, they produce two types of catkins or two types of flowers, so you have male-only flowers, and then you have flowers uh, that are both male and female, uh, so those longer white fuzzy um, strands are, those are the male flowers. And then the female flowers are those little green uh, kind of spiky balls um, there. The, the female flower is going to have three pistils for each burr. So again, we're getting three seeds out of those if you get uh, proper pollination. Typically blooming from end of May to mid to late June. A lot of it depends on a little bit on the cultivar and a little bit on where you are located. Uh, mid to late June, or mid, end of May to, to mid uh, June. Uh, for Missouri, when you start getting into Michigan, um, Michigan State's done a lot of research on chestnuts. They're getting more into late June. So depending on where you're at in the state of Illinois, that, that flowering timing could vary a little bit. And again, pollinator trees need to be within 200 feet um, of one another to get proper pollination. They are primarily wind pollinated, um, although their insects will feed them. Um, when I took this picture here, there was beetles um, everywhere visiting these flowers. Um, but insect pollination is not necessary. They are primarily uh, wind pollinated. So you don't have to worry about um, pollinators and stuff visiting these necessarily. And they also have kind of a, a unique uh, smell to them. It's kind of a sweet smell. Some people don't like it, some people do. Um, I think it smells good personally, but your mileage may vary on that. Uh, when it comes to pests, these are some of the, the common pests. So chestnut weevils can be an issue. What they're going to do, uh, you can see that weevil on the top picture there. They have these long snouts. Um, their mouth is at the end of that snout-like structure there. So they will um, go around. They'll um, chew holes um, in those burrs and, and the eggs on, in the nuts and lay their eggs in there. Um, kind of like um, acorn weevils do. If you've ever collected acorns and they have those circular holes in there, it's because that larvae has crawled out of there. Same idea with chestnut weevils. Uh, so good sanitation is going to be important, making sure you're picking up all the nuts at the end of the year. Um, if those kind of get established um, in your planting, you can take a couple of years of, of management to get those out of there if they get into the soil. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're starting to show up kind of mid-August as those nuts start to fill. Um, so insecticides typically mid-August, at least in Missouri, is probably similar in a lot of parts of Illinois as well. 
Uh, that bottom picture, that is the oriental chestnut gall wasp. Um, it's not in Missouri. I have not heard of it being in Illinois, but this is one to be uh, concerned about. You can see they can form these leaf uh, and twig galls on those plants. Um, and these, these galls are going to reduce shoot elongation, so the branches aren't going to grow as much, reduce fruiting, and you can get twig dieback uh, on these as well. There's really not any good chemical management. There are some um, parasitoid wasps that will attack them, um, but that's kind of a boom and bust cycle. Um, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. It takes a while for them to catch up um, with those gall wasp populations. Um, and just going back to chestnut weevils uh, real quick, if, if you were to grow chestnuts and you have issues with chestnut weevils, um, you can um, treat your nuts with a hot water treatment. So you put them in a 122 degree uh, water bath for about 30 minutes and then immediately cool them, put them in the refrigerator that's 32, 34 degrees, and that would kill any um, weevil larvae that may be present uh, in those nuts. Japanese beetles and caterpillars can also be issues, can be defoliators. Um, they're more of an occasional issue. Um, so you may or may not have to treat for those. Uh, and again, we're talking about trees and, you know, if you're in a, a residential setting, you may or may not have the equipment once these trees get large to be able to treat for those. Um, in an orchard setting, populations get high enough, they would spray for them, but um, most people are probably are not going to have the equipment in order to adequately spray their trees um, for some of this stuff. So just keep that in mind. Um, critters, mammals can also be an issue. So young trees have relatively smooth bark. Uh, the tree in this picture is not a chestnut. This is just an example of those tree guards you can put around there um, to help with rabbits and voles feeding on those, those young trees, stripping that bark. Um, again, if you're using tree guards, you wanna put that down a couple inches into the soil so voles can't tunnel underneath of that. Uh, also a good idea to remove vegetation around trees so voles and stuff can't hide in it. Makes it easier for birds of prey to spot them uh, in the winter and stuff. And as those trees get larger and that bark gets thicker, um, voles and rabbits really don't aren't an issue anymore uh, with those trees. Uh, deer will also feed on trees um, and, the, and the bucks will rub their antlers on there. So again, um, having a way to keep them out of there, whether that's fencing, again, that fencing has to be rather tall. Um, eight plus feet, um, so they can't jump over it. Uh, some kind of tree guard, um, putting in T posts around there so that the bucks can't get in there with their antlers to rub. Various different ways you can go about that repellents, um, what have you. Um, and then the nuts themselves, when the nuts start dropping, all kinds of animals uh, will will feed on those, um, whether that be um, squirrels, um, possums, um, all kinds of other mammals, um, deer, stuff like that, uh, will feed on those nuts. So making sure you're getting out there and picking those up before wildlife can get to them. Uh, as far as diseases, two really big diseases. So again, chestnut blight, uh, you can see that the top picture there, you kind of start off with orangish brown areas on the trunk. Uh, eventually that will turn into a sunken canker and that canker will girdle the tree, basically choking that tree off from the flow of water, nutrients up and down the tree. That Everything above that gird, that um, canker is going to die. So if that gets on the trunk, that tree is dead. Uh, so again, grow resistant trees. If you're not going to grow resistant trees, you know it's not guaranteed you're going to get it, but it's, it's pretty close to guarantee um, that you're going to end up with um, chestnut blight. Uh, Phytophthora root rot can also be an issue. Um, this had this Phytophthora root rot had killed off a lot of the, the American chestnut trees in, the, in its southern range before chestnut blight uh, showed up. So typically, like a lot of other Phytophthora diseases, uh, you start to get wilting and dieback of the canopy. This pathogen is in the soil and affects the root and crown area. Um, you can see in this bottom picture there, this is um, the discolored wood um, near the base of that, that tree on that trunk um, that has been infected by this Phytophthora. Uh, so planting in well-drained soils is important um, to preventing this. That's, that's going to be the best way. Avoidance is going to be the best way of, of dealing with this particular pathogen. Once trees get it, there's really nothing you can do about it. So when it comes to uh, harvesting and storing chestnuts, uh, typically harvest is going to be between September and October. Again, this is um, from Missouri, so it's going to match up with most of Illinois here. 
you want to harvest your nuts at least every other day, preferably every day again, to keep critters away from there. And two is that they don't store particularly long because they have such high water and carbohydrate um, content in them. Uh, so pick them up. As soon as you are done, you want to refrigerate them immediately in a plastic bag. Typically, you put them in a one to two gallon um, plastic um, zip top bag would be good. If you're use, using larger bags, you want to put some holes in there um, so you can get some airflow through there so it doesn't get too too moist and start getting mold issues in there. Uh, for best, so when it comes to picking up the nuts, again, those those burrs are very sharp. So you need to have um, heavy leather gloves are going to be a good idea. In a home situation, you can kind of roll those burrs underneath your foot, underneath your shoes. Make sure you have some pretty good soles on your shoes uh, to release those nuts and you can go pick them up by hand. Uh, in orchard situations, they have uh, machinery that they'll use uh, almost kind of like a vacuum that they can use to suck it up. Um, because the nuts have flat sides on them, it can be kind of difficult to use some of the, the mechanical harvesting tools um, because they lie flat to the ground. It makes it hard to pick up. But there is some specialized equipment, especially from Europe, uh, from Italy, where there's a lot of uh, chestnut production that people have imported some of that machinery to use to harvest. Uh, so you need to let these uh, nuts cure for two to three weeks for best quality. So those starches will start converting into sugar and those nuts will get much sweeter. So you're going to put, again, put these in the refrigerator store 32 to 40 degrees for two to three weeks um, is the best way to do it. You can also store them at room temperature for a couple of days. That process will take place much faster, but you do run the risk of those nuts dehydrating um, and that quality um, being kind of reduced. So just be careful if you, if you go that route. Um, a, a chestnut that's kind of fully cured is going to have a slight give to it. Um, if it's rock hard, it needs to cure a little bit longer. And if there's a lot of give, um, either it's it's starting to decline, it's really starting to dry out, or there's some other kind of issue with that nut. So when it comes to eating chestnuts, that shell is leathery. It's not, again, like we think of with a typical nut, it is not a very thick shell. It's rather thin and leathery. And they have an inner uh, fuzzy skin called the pellicil. And you can see that in some of these chestnuts here. Uh, you want to make sure to remove that. That's kind of a, has a bitter taste to it. Um, so make sure you fully remove that. Typically, a lot, a lot of times they're going to be roasted. So, and when you do that, you want to score those chestnuts. So you can see here, they've got an X on those. Um, and then they can be roasted um, in an oven, typically around 300 degrees for 20 minutes. You can put them in a microwave for a minute and a half, two minutes, depending on the microwave. Um, and if you don't do that scoring, uh, the nuts will explode and you'll have a big mess. I can tell you from personal experience, it's not fun cleaning it up. So make sure you score those. Uh, and like the songs, you can roast them over an open fire. Typically, you want to do it more on the embers. If you have flames on there, the, the, the nuts tend to scorch. So put them in embers. Uh, and depending on how hot the embers are and how many you have, it can take 15 to 30 minutes uh, to cook those nuts. Uh, and when they're cooked, they kind of have a texture similar to a potato, a little bit firmer than a baked potato. Um, but that's kind of like that. And it's a sweet taste. You can also eat them raw. Again, after they've been cured, it's the consistency is kind of like a carrot, maybe a little bit softer than a carrot, um, a kind of crunchy and again, sweet if it's properly cured. If you have chestnuts that dry out too much and become rock hard, you can then grind those into flour and use that for baking. And there's a variety of different recipes out there uh, with chestnuts. Um, there's a lot of Italian cuisine that has chestnuts in it. Um, chestnuts are very popular in China. So again, a lot of recipes from Chinese recipes are going to have chestnuts in them as well. Uh, and then one last slide for me, um, there are efforts to um, re restore the American chestnut in its native range. Uh, there's kind of two different ways, two main ways they're going at this. There is traditional breeding, um, and this comes from the American Chestnut Foundation, some of the work they're doing. Uh, so what they're taking, they're taking uh, American chestnut trees and Chinese chestnut trees and crossing those, and they are back crossing. So they're taking those trees that they get from that, crossing those with American chestnuts, to try to get as pure of American chestnut as they can. They've been doing this for about 30 years. They're currently on their third generation and they've got trees that are about 60 to 90% um, American chestnut genetically. Uh, and when it comes to um, chestnut blight resistance, they're intermediate. So they're in between American and Chinese, Chinese chestnut. So the idea is they wanna introduce this resistance from the Chinese chestnut, but to keep as many of those qualities from the American chestnut. So those big, tall, um, kind of lumber producing species, whereas Chinese chestnut is a much shorter multi-branch tree.
There's also a transgenic approach. Uh, so when it comes to chestnut blight, um, that pathogen, it's going to enter into wounds from the tree and colonize those. It's, it will produce um, oxalic acid, and that acid is going to kill that those tree tissues. That pathogen will start feeding on that, and then it just kind of spreads. Um, they've inserted the um, oxalate um, oxidase gene, the OXO gene from wheat. Um, this gene breaks down oxalic acid so that those that plant tissue isn't being killed. It doesn't affect the pathogen, but that breaks down that oxalic acid so the tree is not damaged. Um, the, the, the tree they've come up with is called Darling 58 that is currently, they have submitted that to the USDA for approval for planting. Um, and, and this tree is basically a pure um, American chestnut, it just has that one gene inserted from wheat and a lot of other plants also have um, this gene as well. So kind of the, the benefit to this is that you, you can have a lot more genetic diversity of, of pure um, American chestnuts. If they can release this, they can, they can cross it with some of the surviving stands of American chestnut um, and, and kind of maintain that diversity of a virtually pure um, American chestnut. So again, that's, that's in the USDA's hand, hands for approval now at this point. Um, and with that, I am done and I will turn it over to Andrew to talk about walnuts. All right, thanks, Ken. This is a picture of walnuts of various kinds. They do come in a variety of shapes and sizes. We can start at the top with the Eastern Black Walnut and go to the clockwise rotation to American Butternut, then uh, Texas Black, which we don't find around here, but I thought it was interesting the size of that. And then uh, the Persian or English Walnut, which were probably more typical to find uh, when we are consuming walnuts. Uh, we do have uh, our native black walnut that's found in Illinois. Uh, the, the Jew in Juglans stands for Jupiter, and the glands is Latin for acorn. So that uh, is a interesting uh, little tidbit of knowledge for you. So the Sorry, let's see here. So the, the, the juglin species, it is uh, deciduous. Those leaves uh, do fall every year. Uh, it's interesting the pattern that with the, which they emerge and which they do fall. It's a little bit, uh, you know, uncharacteristic uh, of some of our other trees in the way that they retain and, uh, you know, open their leaves. They are a compound leaf. They are uh, similar in that they're monoecious. So they have the, the two different uh, types of flowers on the same plant. Uh, the dates of uh, pollen shed the, and female re receptivity are closely related to the leafing dates. And so uh, from pr some studies they have found that the walnut trees can self-pollinate but cross-pollination does improve fruit set and so if you're going to develop uh, a small orchard of uh, black walnuts or uh, such you want to make sure that you have at least four cultivars with overlapping uh, leafing or flowering to ensure the maximum uh, cross-pollination the male flowers are those drooping catkins that are born on the previous year's wood, and the female flowers are on the current year's wood. One of the effects that we find with uh, the black walnut is that it produces a chemical called juglone, and that uh, juglone can inhibit vegetable growth. And so there are some plants uh, that are sensitive to juglone in the vegetable family. And so typically you want to keep your black walnuts away from your vegetable garden. 
Here we see that the, the black walnut can also become a, a fairly large tree and has a nice canopy for shade. So they have uh, researched it and found that it uh, inhibits the respiration process of some of these vegetables, and that's why they don't uh, fare well next to the black walnut. You also want to be cautious whenever not only does the the black walnut uh, produce that juglone in its root system, so you have the whole root system that uh, can pose the problem. But if you had uh, other black walnut materials like leaves or nuts, and you know the possibility of finding a, a black walnut in a mulch can have an effect on plants as well. As far as uh, tree identification, our black walnut, the fruit, is uh, fairly more circular than the other black walnuts, almost uh, perfectly spherical. It is uh, more hardy than the other walnuts that we find, and a little bit uh, more flavorful too. Uh, the color of the kernel does uh, vary with the length of time that you leave that husk on the on that uh, seed. So it can be a valuable timber tree, one of the probably the most prized woods, but if you're growing it uh, for nut production, it's, it's very difficult to have uh, both the same characteristics of a, a nut tree and a timber tree all in one uh, grown in the they're grown in different uh, techniques as far as uh, the amount of branching because you don't want uh, excessive branching whenever you're growing it for timber, but we do want to space them out whenever we're growing them for nut production. And you especially want to avoid excessively wet soil and we'll cover some of the other characteristics in a later slide. There are a number of uh, varieties that are available uh, throughout the state. We have uh, Sparrow, which was originated from Illinois. Uh, the Sparrow cultivar cracks well with exceptional total kernel percentage. It does have an excellent nut flavor and a good color. It's uh, very resistant to anthracnose. Uh, the nut of this tree is small unless the tree is grown on a, a good site. So. Selecting that site can be a, a consideration to have the best nut production. M. McKay is another uh, cultivar that originated from Illinois. Uh, M. McKay has a thin shell and cracks out at a high percentage of kernels. And uh, not all of the nuts uh, fill well in heavy crop years, but the nut flavor is reputed to be excellent. So the tree does have a spreading crown. And there are other uh, cultivars to choose from. We have the, the Myers that is uh, popular for central or southern Illinois. And this uh, originated from Ohio. It's uh, probably uh, one of the more exceptional total kernel or first crack kernel uh, percentages and a high re recovery of the quarters of the walnut. Uh, there are differences in the, the length of the season as far as uh, the season length. So Sparrow has a season length of 119 days, Emma K 148 days, and Thomas Myers a season length of 131 days. An interesting uh, website link here is uh, from the University of Missouri. And they have uh, where you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of the, the various cultivars or varieties and uh, make some ad identification possibilities and different comparisons to the, uh, the way that the inside of the nut looks. We have uh, English walnut, which is also known as Persian walnut. These are the kind that you find uh, grown in California. They do need a shorter season uh, for the varieties that are grown in Illinois. 
uh, due to the threat of blossom kill from late spring frost. Now these uh, typically can be grafted uh, and they have been found to be grafted on uh, black walnut. They are susceptible to some diseases, uh, so you want to use uh, grafted trees uh, for more resistant varieties. So when growing uh, the Persian walnuts, we have uh, the Hansen and Colby are the two main cultivars, and the, the Hansen and Colby are self-fruitful and do not require cross-pollination. But again, this is the typical uh, walnut that we tend to find around the holiday season. We also have butternuts, which uh, have a more long elongated uh, nut. They're also known as the white walnut. They do hybridize uh, somewhat, but they are very susceptible to disease. They are susceptible to walnut bunch disease. Uh, typically not a long-lived uh, tree, but they do prefer the rich, uh, well-drained soil and can get uh, somewhat sizable of 40, to feet, 40 feet to 60 feet tall. This is uh, an orchard thinning plan. So if you were growing more in a commercial basis, this is uh, an example uh, basically from uh, Missouri that they show how to thin uh, your nut trees. And so you start with a 30 by 30 foot spacing and then uh, remove about half of those trees or every other tree alternating. So that uh, the first thinning, so then you end up with 24 trees per acre and then your final uh, spacing would be uh, 12 trees per acre. And so maximizing the amount of space that you have, but uh, these trees can become overcrowded and you don't want uh, them to be overcrowded. You wanna have room to, so that the sunlight is able to reach the lower branches and to stimulate that fruit production. So your minimum spacing would should be at least 25 to 30 feet, depending on your soil type. And uh, if you have uh, trees that are in a floodplain, you probably want a, a wider distance because they're going to be able to grow uh, better and more quickly. And then uh, for less optimum soils, you may push that uh, spacing a little closer to 25 feet by 25 feet. Now there are uh, different methods of growing walnuts. Uh, typically probably the, the easiest and the, the best is growing the grafted. Uh, you just purchase the grafted tree and you plant that, uh, probably come uh, bare root. Uh, for your Persian walnut spacing, there's gonna be a, a closer spacing than for your black walnut. So for those Hanson varieties, uh, 35 by 35 feet, other varieties of the Persian walnut, uh, 50 by 50. You can plant uh, seedlings, but uh, typically if you're gonna be uh, planting a rootstock uh, for the black walnut, you wanna use uh, either a quick crop or a sparrow cultivar. And you can uh, plant uh, black walnuts or other walnut nuts, but there is a stratification or a cold treatment that's required in order to uh, get those nuts to sprout, and you'll best uh, likely to put those in the refrigerator and to uh, accomplish that task. So as far as growing black walnuts, they do perform best on uh, a well-drained soil and uh, can't overemphasize the, the deep in that well-drained soil. They have to have uh, conducive conditions for the the roots to be able to expand and uh, they do well in neutral soils for the the walnuts so generally between six and seven and a half for the ph again you want to avoid those shallow so soils excessively wet 
and anything that's going to restrict uh, those uh, those roots to penetrate uh, to a depth of less than three feet. So be cautious if you have a hard pan or other obstacle for those uh, walnut trees. When it comes to uh, your nutrient requirements, uh, the primary uh, concern will be with nitrogen fertilization. That's going to be essential for stimulating nut production. So you can uh, add uh, nitrogen uh, once uh, the trees begin bearing is uh, more critical. And so you'll probably apply nitrogen uh, fertilizers at least two times uh, during the year. But they could be applied, you know, on a more regular basis. They're only able to use the the nitrogen if it's uh, readily available in the soil. So they're not going to use the nitrogen throughout the winter time. You have to have leaves on the trees for the nitrogen to be uh, taken up. And so typically during your growing seasons, when you're going to be applying the nitrogen, uh, some example fertilizers to use: uh, 20, 10, 10. And depending on your soil, uh, you know, a soil test can go a long way to look at your overall nutrients. And you can uh, sample the, the foliage and find out uh, based on the analysis of those leaves uh, where exactly the nutrients are being uh, in relation to what is needed. There are some major insect pests. So you have the, the walnut husk fly, uh, some foliage eating caterpillars, uh, the black walnut cucurlio, uh, the walnut shoot moth, uh, ambrosia beetle, and piercing sucking insects. So quite a few uh, insects to, to be concerned with. Uh, the backyard home or orchardist uh, probably isn't going to have a lot of the chemicals and capacity to spray these large trees so they'll probably have uh, some uh, issues with insects and uh, another uh, issue with uh, nut trees is that they tend to be alternate bearing so depending on the particular cultivar some are more conducive to bearing uh, every year than you know on alternate years or alternate bearing so that can be a consideration in your choices. Some major diseases for the walnut. Uh, one of the more uh, presently found or publicized is the thousand cankers uh, disease of walnut. Uh, they can also be plagued by anthracnose, walnut blight, walnut bunch, a leaf spot, and butternut canker. So a number of diseases that can uh, cause problems. And on to hazelnuts with Chris Enroth. All right, well, as we transition here, folks, I know we are past our hour time. If you do have to hop off here, that is okay. We will send out a recording uh, of this webinar. So please feel free. Uh, uh, if you need to, to hop off. Otherwise, though, this section will be relatively short because this is a newer crop for Illinois. If you do have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat box and we will get to those here in just a second. Uh, so when we are talking about hazelnuts, yes, it is that very hazelnut, that uh, thing that sets peanut butter apart when we talk about Nutella. You get a little bit of cocoa powder in there and boy, you got a delicious spread that I think tops peanut butter for the most part. But when it comes to hazelnut, I think we're going to be talking about two species here. Most of us are probably more familiar with the European hazelnut. If you have bought, say, hazelnuts at the grocery store uh, or, or, you know, again, used uh, processed hazelnuts in some shape or form, it's probably going to be a European type or also Turkish type of hazelnut. Uh, and that is a different species than our Native American hazelnut, uh, Coralus americana. Uh, we also do have another native hazelnut named beaked hazelnut, but we won't cover that one today. Um, so again, we kind of dealing with two different types of species when it comes to hazelnut as a crop. So European hazelnut, also known as European filbert, uh, that's the primary commercially grown hazelnut. And it's not as cold hardy as our native hazelnut. Uh, only hardy to zone seven to eight for the most part. 
But our native hazelnut, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of a smaller plant. We would call it maybe a multi-stem shrub. Think more of it as like a lilac. Uh, as opposed to a, a tree as we've been seeing more today. And it's much more cold hardy, hardy up to zone four. Uh, you can grow it in part sun to part shade. And um, it, you know, I heard a, a lot of uh, constrictions in terms of soils uh, for some of our other plants, but in terms of uh, soil type, hazelnut grows from wet to dry and everything in between. It's a pretty uh, versatile plant in terms of our native hazelnut. Uh, and again, it's fairly short, only tops out about 18 foot tall and 12 foot wide. And this is American hazelnut. This is growing here in central Illinois, right on the edge of a prairie right here. Uh, you can see the clusters of hazelnuts. This picture was taken about two weeks ago, uh, about the end of November. And uh, so you can still see their hazelnuts developed here and the prairie has turned to its fall uh, glory. Uh, primary differences here, again, as we compare and contrast European to American hazelnut, European hazelnut is grown more as a tree, so I want in your mind to think more apple orchard style, whereas American hazelnut, that's grown more as a shrub, so uh, think about how blueberries might be grown on a farm, you know, in rows, but they're shrubs. Uh, when it comes to the European hazelnut, as I mentioned, this is what you'll find at the grocery store more than likely, uh, and you find it there because it has a thinner husk and larger kernel, which we'll see a picture of that here in a second. Uh, American hazelnut is not a common crop. But as we'll mention here in a bit, it is currently in development and hopefully we'll see it more across the Midwest here. Uh, in terms of European hazelnut, Turkey is probably the top exporter in the world of hazelnuts. Uh, from European, also they have their Turkish uh, species that they work with too. Um, and so when we think about, again, cultivation differences, pictured on the left side of the screen there, that is a European hazelnut uh, orchard. And as you can see here, the, the ground is completely denuded of vegetation. That's because the way they harvest this is they just go through with their equipment and they sweep the orchard floor of the hazelnuts that fall onto the ground. So they need a clean orchard floor, no vegetation. And so that's what it looks like here. Compare that to the American hazelnut on the right side of the screen. Again, that is a shrub. Um, and growing here in the Midwest, can you imagine if we denuded the vegetation all around our plantings here, we would just get things would just wash out. We would get all kinds of erosion problems because um, unlike where a lot of European hazelnuts are grown in more arid climates where they don't get much rain late in the season, American hazelnut, well, that's grown in the Midwest. We get fall rains. We would have erosion and all kinds of problems. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting our soil. A major difference between uh, the European an American hazelnut is the size of uh, the, the different uh, kernel size right here. So on the left side, again, is the European hazelnut. So I would uh, probably liken this to maybe silver dollar size, maybe slightly smaller than a ping pong ball. Compare that to the American hazelnut on the right side of the screen, and I would compare that to more pea-sized uh, on there. And so uh, in essence, we need a lot more American hazelnuts to uh, make up for the, the size difference with the European hazelnut. But there is this one thing that uh, in terms of how we use hazelnuts, you can roast them, you can turn them to flour, uh, you can eat them raw. Uh, you can also turn them into oils. And actually when they break out all of the, the fats within these and the oil that's created from hazelnut, they actually so show that the oleic fat, uh, that, that fatty acid there is actually greater in our American or our native hazelnut. And uh, that's the good fat in there. That's the, the thing. And we compare that to olive oil. And actually, because olive oil is so highly regulated, um, <laughs> they find that a lot of people who try to cut olive oil or try to dilute it with another oil are using hazelnut oil. Uh, but in, in essence, they're using a higher quality fat uh, with that they're cutting it with. Uh, so I just thought that was interesting, and this is actually a, a growing market. Uh, you can go up into the northern parts of the U.S., like Minnesota, Wisconsin, and you can find hazelnut oil where this is starting to catch on as more of a cash crop. Well, they did try to grow European hazelnuts here in the United States. Uh, efforts were made to introduce this production uh, about early 20th century. Uh, and so they introduced the European species in North America, they were growing, and then they all started to die throughout the U.S., except in Oregon. 
the Cascade Mountains over in Oregon kind of isolated, created this isolated pockets where the hazelnuts, the European hazelnuts were able to thrive without being affected by, Europe, uh, by Eastern filbert blight, uh, which is a Native American disease. It's native to North America. Uh, it, 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 it does live on our North American hazelnuts. Doesn't bother them though. Uh, and so, but it does bother the non-native European hazelnut. And so it completely made it uh, a, a not, you could not grow this at all without throughout the most of the US except Oregon, which by 1970, of course, um, you know, the Eastern filbert blight showed up. And pictured here on the left side of the screen is actually contorted hazelnut, which is an ornamental type of uh, hazelnut uh, that is a European type. And this was brought into our McDonough County Extension Office. Uh, and you can see the pustules here, these raised pustules or cankers, we'll call them. Uh, they go in this cool line. I thought this was really neat uh, when I first saw this. And so this, uh, it creates these raised bumps along the stem like that totally kills the tree. So uh, yeah, we don't necessarily want to be planting European hazelnuts in our neck of the woods. Now we do have some pests for the American hazelnut. Uh, we do have the hazelnut weevil, the Cucurillo obtusus, which is native once again, so not really a bother. Uh, pictured here is actually the chestnut weevil uh, that uh, Ken showed earlier because I couldn't find a copyright free picture of hazelnut weevil. So they look practically the same. And they do the same thing. They feed and they lay eggs on developing hazelnuts. The eggs hatch and larvae bur burrow into the kernel, just like what we see with acorns. When you pick up acorns and it's got the little hole in there, hey, there you go. That's that They're just doing what nature has intended for them to do. And because we've never really grown American hazelnut as a crop, there are no chemicals labeled for controlling insects on American hazelnut. Uh, there are, however, chemical controls for European hazelnut. So just making sure that we're reading those labels carefully. Now, growing American hazelnut in Illinois, this can be a very functional plant for our landscape. You can use this as a screening plant. Uh, it makes a great hedge, I would think. Uh, it also provides, of course, that edible crop there in the fall months. Uh, and it can perform as a windbreak. And I'll show you a picture here of that in a second. Some of that ornamental value of the hazelnut is the male catkins. It's pictured actually uh, here on the right side of the screen. These will develop uh, in the fall and persist from winter into the early spring. Um, and so hazelnut is wind pollinated and you do need multiple plants for pollination to take effect. So just keep that in mind. Um, the other ornamental value is that there is some fall color. We do have some reds and oranges. Some folks say there's some yellows too. I've not really seen that that much, but they can be there. Um, nut production is variable because again, we are studying a native species that has a lot of genetic diversity. And so we don't necessarily have cultivars or varieties where we can, you know, put an exact yield number on these things. So it's very di diverse. Uh, uh, of a pool that we're uh, kind of looking at here. Now, when it comes to inputs, with everything we've talked about today, I consider them to be relatively low input, at least from my standpoint. Um, you know, I'm kind of a, not necessarily a hands-off gardener, but I don't like to uh, fiddle too much with certain plants in terms of having to deal with pests and fertility, things like that. When it comes to fertilizing our hazelnut, there's not really much information for our native species. However, they are hybridizing our Native American hazelnut with the European hazelnut to get the larger kernel size of the European and the disease resistance and cold hardiness of our Native North American hazelnut. And so we are starting to see uh, trials uh, take place with hybridized hazelnuts. And when looking at fertility for those, really the only thing that they see limiting for most hazelnuts is nitrogen. Uh, and when it comes to timing or application, right now initial studies are showing that kind of a late to, or sorry, mid to late summer application of a nitrogen fertilizer is really in, in terms of timing and what's needed is the best thing. So again, these are perennial crops. These are uh, going, they have root systems in the soil all year long. They have the time to find the soil resources that they need. And again, for the most part in Illinois, we have fantastic soil. The only limiting thing sometimes is nitrogen. And this is a very high value for wildlife. All sources that I read all remarked how good of a wildlife, not only food source, but also habitat, uh, shelter uh, source. This can be nesting for birds and uh, so on. 
So pictured here is uh, American hazelnut in a windbreak. So uh, I was pretty close here when I was taking this picture, but this is uh, the hazelnut shrub in the uh, kind of the middle part of the picture is uh, a line of oaks. This is a windbreak. And then in the background, you can kind of see those evergreens uh, lining the back of that windbreak. And so this is a fairly diverse windbreak. It's, it was created for uh, having more habitat diversity in it, providing shelter for birds and, and other animals. And so hazelnut does provide that here. Uh, so I, I went out and I visited this uh, windbreak uh, a few weeks ago. And I found the clusters of hazelnuts, and this is what they look like. Uh, it's kind of like if I could compare them to acorns, it's like acorns, but they have much more fashion sense when it comes to their caps, uh, and they grow in these clusters here. Uh, so these uh, the, the husks or the tops of these acorns, they're very papery, and the, the actual nut here that will fall out fairly easily when we process them. So I grabbed this cluster and I took it home, um, as with permission, of course, from the landowner. Um, so this is what we get when we uh, uh, process these hazelnuts here. So here's that initial cluster of the American hazelnuts. Here is that, that nut that I pull out of there in, in its shell. We crack the shell and then inside we have that kernel. You can see that penny right there. This uh, kernel is smaller than that penny. So again, these are pretty small. Um, and you know, I took a bite of this and it was delicious. I took a bite raw and um, it, it tasted uh, fantastic. We didn't roast it. So um, I, I, I found this to be a, an incredible plant. I didn't take any more of these to take a bite of or to roast them or try anything different because I hope to plant these uh, in some pots and just stick them outside to get that cold, moist stratification over the winter. And hopefully I can sprout my own hazelnuts to grow uh, within my own uh, backyard where I have some pawpaws and other edible uh, crops, uh, woody crypt plants out there. Uh, so let's say you wanna go out and grow some hazelnuts. So here's some information for you. Cultivated types are probably going to be hard to find. I mean, for American hazelnut, you're, you'll find seedlings galore at like conservation nurseries, native plant nurseries, uh, conservation fundraisers and groups will, will be giving away or selling American hazelnut seedlings. Uh, you can find those everywhere. Uh, but again, those are seedlings. There's no guarantee it's gonna yield well or much at all. Um, so cultivated types are gonna be hard to find. Hybrids are just now starting to come onto the market, and really the trials haven't necessarily all finished up yet. Um, there's still a lot of research going on between universities of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nebraska, and Rutgers, and they're all partnering, you know, with Oregon State University to help develop hybrids between the European and the American types uh, to create something that can be grown here in, in the Midwest. If you want more of the most up-to-date information on growing hazelnuts here, there is the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative. I've left that web link right here uh, in the description here, or in the, the slide right here. So midwesthazelnuts.org, check them out for those, the most up-to-date information because uh, things are happening pretty quickly here uh, on the hazelnut front. And hopefully this will be a crop that will be growing here in Illinois in the near future. So with that, just a reminder, uh, good growing. We do have a blog and podcast. Uh, this week we talked with Diane Plua about plant pathology and what happens at the plant clinic on campus. Uh, so you can check that out this week. Also our blog any time of the week. Now is a great time for question. I see the chat box is happening and we do have an evaluation. Uh, you can scan this QR code on the right side of the screen with your phone or go to go.illinois.edu slash ggnuts and we will uh, love your feedback for that. For now, let's check out the chat box.